Hello, everyone. Welcome to another IR capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, we are taking up the question of Indian space program, specifically because there have been some developments relating to an old spy case which had affected the functioning of the ISRO. There have always been speculation that many Western countries, particularly the United States, were not very keen on India developing a space program, not to have competition outside a limited number of countries which already had attained that level of proficiency in space program. In fact, some of you may remember that after the Chandrayaan mission, there was a cartoon in a Western newspaper showing an Indian, half-naked Indian, uh, with a cow, accompanied by a cow, knocking at the door of a luxurious space club. In other words, India was kind of storming into a privileged class. That was the uh, point of the, of the cartoon. In other words, they were very envious that a country like India, which is considered poor, was entering into the space program. But in actual fact, even in the last century, India has been engaged in a space program, very modest initially, but it had grown further and we had reached a stage of sending up rockets and uh, gathering information and even sending up rockets for other countries. So it was not that India had suddenly burst into the space scene. It was a, an effort started many years ago by people like APJ Abdul Kalam in Trivandrum, and it had developed into a space program which could be comparable to many of the other countries of the world which had the, the space capability. So, and this, therefore the Chandrayaan or uh, other missions with the PSLB rocket was something that India had developed indigenously all these years. But later, we felt that uh, the, our propulsion uh, material should be changed. We were using um, the, uh, liquid, uh, the uh, solid propellers and we needed to move into modern technology. And therefore, we requested the Soviet Union, at that time it was still the Soviet Union, uh, to give us uh, technology for cryogenic engine to increase the capability of India's uh, uh, ability to lift up much bigger payloads. That was the whole idea. And we signed a contract with the Soviets. At that time, it was still the Soviet Union. But the United States requested the Soviet Union not to give the cryogenic Indian to, engine to India for fear of technological competition. And uh, the person who made that request was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who was none other than the president, the president Biden of today. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, which asked the Soviet Union not to supply this particular technology to India. And of course, they made the usual threat that if this was done, uh, they would impose sanctions against uh, Soviet Union. Something like recently when we were buying S-400 missiles, Americans tried to stop it, but in the new circumstances, they gave us an exemption. So a similar thing happened at that time. This I'm talking about early 93, 94. And um, so the Russians uh, promptly wanted to cancel the contract. But there was a young scientist uh, who was in charge of this program, thought of a bright idea of trying to get, because what was told to the Soviet Union was to was not to give us cryogenic technology. 
So he told the Soviets that, okay, don't give us any cryogenic technology, but just supply an engine within the present contract. And uh, we would be quite happy with that. The rest you can, you know, forget about it. And the, Russia, and the Soviets agreed to give this engine. But they said, you have to find a way to fly this into India. We will not take the responsibility. He asked Air India. Air India said, no, this is suspicious. Americans may be offended. So we will not lift it. So this young man found a way to find an airline somewhere in Central Asia and got the engine flown, flown via Pakistan, of all places, because that was how that flight came. And it came to Trivandrum. So this was just an engine. It did not have the technological capability to adopt it. But this particular instance was seen by the Americans as a kind of offensive action by this particular scientist. His name is Nambi Narayanan. You must have heard the name. He was in the news. Of course, he has been in the news for many, many years. So this was found at the Americans. And this, we are uh, speculating what may have happened. And uh, everybody forgot about it, but they handed it over to the CIA to investigate as to what happened and who did it. And if necessary, whoever did it must be punished. So people are unaware of it. But suddenly, this little city of Trivandrum, which is quiet and sleepy, was rocked by a spy scandal with all elements of a spy movie. You know, the two Maldivian women had come to Trivandrum. Yes, they had come to Trivandrum. And the story was that they honey trapped the scientists and some other police officers and sold the tri cryogenic engine to Pakistan. This was the allegation. And so several people were arrested. With that, this scientist who was a promise for India was very skillful. Uh, basically, the man who uh, made India strong in propulsion techniques. And he was arrested. And for two years, he was imprisoned, imprisoned and tortured. And the point to be made was that at that time, India had no cryogenic engine technology available to us. And even if it was available to us, it cannot be sold like that. It cannot be packed and sent away to Pakistan. That is not the kind of technology it is. It will take years and years of learning and documentation, etc., to transfer technology like that. But police people, particularly of the Kerala police, uh, decided that uh, this was done. And they tortured him really badly just to make him say that he did it. But he refused and therefore he suffered a lot of injuries. and Almost his life was in danger. And then suddenly wisdom prevailed on the government. And they transferred the case from the Kerala police to the uh, CBI. Central Bureau of Investigation. So Central Bureau of Investigation did a thorough inquiry. And by 96, he was arrested in 94. By 96, not only he, but all those accused were exonerated and released from prison, saying that this whole plot was fabricated. So we do not know who started the scandal, but we knew that this was also got involved in some kind of power politics in the Kerala government against the chief minister and the supporters, etc. That's another story. We don't have to go into that. We are concerned basically about the impact of this incident on our space program. So once the uh, CBI let him go, of course, he became, all of them became free. But Mr. Nabi Narayanan said, this cannot end here. I should know the truth of this matter. And I should also be compensated for what happened to me. Nobody would like that to happen to anybody. And so he continued the court battle. And the battle went on for 11 years. And finally, he was not only compensated financially, but also he was given a Balma Bhushan Award in recognition of his service to the nation. And now, of course, he is totally exonerated. He is considered a hero of uh, space research in India. And he is uh, you know, living here 
in Trivandrum, engaged in various other activities related to space research. Why this whole idea now came up, the story came up is because the new movie has been released. Many of you may have seen it. I haven't seen it yet. It is called Rocketry, the Numbi Effect. So till now, till this movie came out, mostly the focus was on the suffering and injustice to Nambi Narayan. But nobody knew the amount of work he had done and the amount of work that the uh, space research organization had done and how much advance he had made in the technology of cryogenic engine. And though it was delayed, we were able to use it. In 2001, we were able to you know, uh, send a satellite up with the Russian cryogenic engine. And uh, 2017, we were able to develop our own cryogenic engine. So what should have happened in 1994 if we had got the technology? It got delayed by many years, but we still managed to do that. That's the point I'm trying to make. So the fear was that this whole exercise was done by foreign interests, particularly the United States, targeting the entire Indian space program. That was the theory. But this movie has shown that the role played by Mr. Nambi Narayan in this particular instance may have ignited this problem and not that they were against India's space program as such. So that is the new information. But that new information is of not much importance to us. But the important thing to remember is that the ISRO, one of the most uh, uh, prestigious organization among the public sector undertakings, suffered on account of this, but our program went forward and uh, we managed to do many things, including the moon and the Mars. And uh, we became a respected member of the space club. So did this impact negatively on Indian space program? That is something which we are yet to find out. So the study is going on, investigation is going on as to how this happened. But this spirit of this scientist, which in a dogged pursuit of a cause, has been well portrayed in this Bollywood biopic, as it is called. Most storytellers were focusing on the torture and the wrong that was done to Nambi Narayanan and how he was finally exonerated by the Supreme Court of India. But the movie dwells at length on the space odyssey of India and Narayanan's signal contribution to science. And that is the significance of the movie. And that is why it may be of interest to civil service candidates. Because when you review the space program of India, uh, this particular instance, regardless of the suffering of a person or the uh, suffering it caused to a large number of families who are all accused of so many things, but uh, that the ability of the ISRO to survive this. But there is one unknown element in, here, in this, because when Mr. Nambi Narayanan was arrested in 94, it would have been very easy for the ISRO to issue a press release saying that this is not possible because we did not have a cryogenic engine technology with us. Why the government of India did not do what? That's a mystery. But in 1996, just before he was exonerated, the senior officials of the ISRO, they issued a statement that he was unjustly accused because it was not possible for him to, even if he had wanted, he would not have been able to transfer any technology to, to Pakistan. It was actually um, when the when the kind time when we were developing the cryogenic engine till 2017, there was evidence that several foreign agents were trying to sabotage this further. Sanctions, 
technology denials, and even pressure on the USSR to halt cryogenic engine technology transfer on false excuses. So then what ISRO did, again by the, in the leadership of uh, Mr. Narayanan, which developed something called a Viking engine, which they had developed earlier, and it was used as the major powering rockets of India. It was Viking engine, but later it was named Vikas engine, which is uh, uh, in the name of uh, Mr. Vikram Sarabhai. So this Vikas engine is now the main propeller of all these flights that we see. It has never failed in 53 flights so far. Um, done by the ISRO, even the Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan. In other words, the damage done by the spy scandal was marginal, and India is very much on its way to claiming a fair share of the of the uh, uh, space available to the world. I should also mention that. I interviewed Mr. Nambi Narayanan last week on a program called Tea with TPS. Some of you may be familiar with that. In which I spoke to him for about one hour. If you're interested, please go to YouTube and look for Tea with TPS and you will find this one hour recording of my conversation with him. So he, after so many years, was recounting his experiences, the whole horror of it, the difficulty of it, you know, he, but he was very calm and cool about it, maybe because it's after so many years. But the movie brought out all this tragedy in a big way, in a very uh, detailed manner. And now we know how much he suffered and also how much he had contributed to India's space program. So he, he was more concerned when he was talking to me about the loss the government of India and the ISRO sustained on account of these many years of uncertainty, rather than about his own story. But he has not stopped it there, even though he says that as far as I'm concerned, the story is over. I have been honored by the government of India. I've been compensated. And so I am willing to forget everything for that purpose. But at the same time, he said, it is in the interest of India and of the ISRO, that the whole operation of the spy scandal, who managed it, who were the people involved. And therefore, he is now not the, he has not taken the case himself, but he is the prime witness to a case which has started investigating into the uh, scandal itself and trying to find out who was responsible for it. So, so he, the cruelty and injustice done to him is yet to be exposed. Uh, but it is quite clear that he was not involved in it. It is also clear that they were, that, that for foreign forces uh, trying to uh, sabotage the Indian program. But one thing is certain in my mind uh, that he was targeted basically because the kind of 007 activity undertook Without, of course, his seniors knew about it, but nobody knew the specifics of it. And he individually, heroically did something, which irritated perhaps the present president of United States, Joe Biden, because he was the chairman of this uh, Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So this is the story has come up. So I would recommend that you watch the movie. I haven't, but I will. But at least uh, listen to his uh, narration of what happened in answer to my questions. And that will benefit you in several ways. Well, the, uh, nobody may ask in the examination of the spy scandal, but uh, space is a very important aspect of, uh, of India's growth. And this can figure in various uh, uh, question papers and discussions. And also maybe in your interview, people could ask you this question. And that is why I decided to feature it uh, today. 
Uh, but there have been another there has been another development after we fixed this and that was the incident in taiwan incident in the sense that uh, you must have read uh, that the speaker the of the us congress nancy pelosi actually visited taiwan she has just left and this has become a big international event because the chinese have not only protested they have started what they call a military operation around Taiwan to show their concern and anger at what she did. Maybe we'll deal with this in another capsule. But I just wanted to uh, flag that such an incident has happened and we need to follow it in detail in the next few days. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yes. That's why the American, I mean, US is a superpower. They have changed regimes in many countries. <laughs> How many times they have changed regimes. So this is a minor show for them. This is not a very complicated process because you can always buy people in any country. They are willing to sell their own country for some concentration. And that is a human failing. And the Americans are very clever and dexterous, as you say to deal with such issues. So, the, in fact, Mr. Nabinarayanan has said that uh, the movie is almost uh, perfect in the sense that uh, there's no exaggeration, there is no uh, in any, any kind of uh, innuendo in it. And the story was actually you know, not taken to the Bollywood level, but it was worked out on a realistic basis. So this is quite believable. No, nobody else has been compensated, but of course they have been exonerated. And that, that will come after the further investigation now that is taking place. Because he had uh, sued them on his own because of his suffering. Nobody else seems to have done that. But if it is finally established that uh, the Kerala police or anybody else in Kerala was involved in this, then this other question might also arise. I believe these uh, Maldivian women have asked for compensation. But that will all go to the court after the investigation. It's already many, many years. Uh, but justice is slow, but sure. And uh, it may happen in the future. Because the exception in the case of Nambi Narayanan was that he had made a big contribution to the Indian space program. So it is not that, that somebody has been uh, you know, uh, arrested and tortured. He's a national hero. And that is the reason why Prime Minister himself spoke about it and uh, gave him a Padma Bhushan and also the Human Rights uh, Commission asked the Kerala government to pay the compensation. Well, this is an evolution that you are referring to. You see, we were able to sign the nuclear deal in 2008. But before that, many things had happened. Uh, this China angle, as you say, is now a reality. And now we are in the quad. And um, in space, you know, the Indo-Pacific is of great interest to the US. And they find ourselves as a partner in that. And that is what helped us to have the nuclear deal. But before that, before Obama's time, or uh, before Bush's time, the idea was, I was in the US several times during that period, was to stop India from having any nuclear program because their concern at that time was Pakistan rather than China. So they felt that we were developing nuclear uh, technology in order to counter Pakistan or deter Pakistan. China was not in the picture. Americans were quite confident of dealing with the Chinese. But towards the present century, it changed and the American policy also changed. And they were looking for partners, particularly democratic countries in Asia Pacific. So this is a recent development, but at the time of this time, they were totally against any kind of development of India, either in space of nuclear technology. And that is why they stopped the Russians from 
during the cryogenic Indian to us. So this new element of a partnership with India was not clear at that time. Yes, they would also be punished, I presume, because uh, that will be a, a long drawn out case. Because uh, it is established that this allegation was wrong. Allegation was baseless. Simple as that. Because we had no technology to transfer <laughs> anyway. But how did it work? And it's supposed to have brought down a chief minister of Kerala. There are all these, those aspects are neither in the movie nor in the investigation that has taken place till now. So that is yet to happen. But it will happen. Well, there's hardly anything you can do with uh, this secret operations of, of foreign countries. We do investigate, but they will never leave a trace. Baba's accident, for example, it is by a kind of imagination that we are thinking it may have happened. But it is an air crash in the mountains, and the pilot may have just lost control. So they will not leave any trace of it. And therefore, CIA definitely is the most advanced technology they have. In any time of history, at that particular moment, they had the upper hand in science. And therefore, they will not leave any trace. So these are just speculation, really. You cannot really establish it. And that is the, the uh, idea that they are able to do that without leaving a trace. But uh, we do talk about it. We have uh, raised questions, but those will not be answered. No, no spy agency will answer those questions. But we protect our scientists, as you know, because we have this concern. And uh, several scientists have been killed in various ways. And others may have been even um, you know, removed from the scene. They may be working for the CIA at this point. It could happen. So that's a bigger story. But what we have to learn from this is that they had hesitation in making India powerful. Let me say one more thing. You know, after the 2008 nuclear deal, we were supposed to import reactors from the United States. But no reactor has come till today. Do you know why? The reason given is that India has changed its compensation law. You must be aware of that. You know, Indian parliament passed a law saying that if there is an accident in any of these reactors supplied by foreign countries, the compensation will have to be paid by the supplier and not by the operator. And this is contrary to international law. So when Mr. Modi made his first visit to US, he tried to resolve it. In fact, he even announced when he came back that this is true, that we are going to have some kind of an insurance program in which India and the US will cooperate and thus will be resolved. But it has not been resolved till today. So I happened to be in Washington in that period. And I asked a very senior person in the White House, whose name I can never reveal, as to what the prospects were of India getting these reactors. You know what he told me? He said, we have signed this deal so that you are able to go and buy these reactors from anybody. But we in our heart of hearts do not want to give you technology because we don't want to be held responsible for China, India's growth as a nuclear power. This is what he told me. I wrote about it at that time, which created a sensation. That was in 2017, I think. And many people pressurized me to reveal the name, but I did not. I could not and I should not. But that's what has happened, looking back at history. Till today, no reactor has been established, no American reactor in India. There were sub six locations were suggested in Andhra Pradesh. None of them was used. So there is this inherent reluctance uh, by West. It may be changing now because of our new relationship. But this was there all through in their um, dealings with India as far as space and nuclear technology are concerned.
Certainly. India's relationship with U.S. and its relations with Israel are two different stories altogether. Because Israel is a product of the United States. It has been supported, strengthened, looked after. And, and you know the reason. Because there are more Jews in New York than in Israel. Don't forget that. And the financing of many big tech companies are based in Israel. So the story in Washington is that nothing happens in the United States relating to the Middle East without consultation with the Israeli ambassador in Washington. This may be true. So that is the kind of relationship. But our relationship is far from that. We don't have that kind of relationship with the US. So they will support Israel much more than they would support anybody else. Okay. Uh, we are indigenous in many ways because we have indigenous reactors. Of course, this idea of uh, buying reactors came up uh, because till that period, we were prevented from getting anything from outside because we have not signed the NPT. And uh, there was the Nuclear Suppliers Club established in 1974 to prevent India from developing to nuclear technology beyond our first experiment. So this group of countries who were capable of supplying nuclear material became a cartel in order to prevent any technology going to India. It was an India-specific grouping. Of course, they gave an exemption for, from that in 2008. And therefore, now we are able to buy. But even as we are able to buy, we are not getting everything that we want. And therefore, it is essentially indigenous reactors. In fact, this is what we are doing. Now that we have not been able to buy any foreign reactors, except the good old Kurt and Kulam, which is still functioning. Uh, we have now changed track. Now we are saying that uh, we'll establish more um, the traditional Indian technology reactors. Of course, if we, would have, if we had got foreign reactors, we would have been able to increase our nuclear power much more and also save ourselves from climate change. Because as you know, nuclear technology is clean technology as far as the atmosphere is concerned. So we have failed in that. And so we have set it aside and we are moving ahead with developing our own technology. And the uranium is very much in the process of becoming a, a good material for, uh, for nuclear reactors. It has not come. Scientists have been promising 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but still has not become economically viable. And also we are now participating in the other program which takes place in France implosion rather than explosion, so that the danger of, uh, of uh, weapon making is not there. That also has not reached any final stages. So these two alternatives we have, and uh, if one of them comes about, either uranium or the implosion technology uh, comes about, then we will have our own uh, technology to deal with it. But at the moment, we have to go on with the present uh, situation. Yes, that is because of China. The Americans are quite willing to take us into NSC. In fact, that proposal was made by the Americans that uh, now that we have signed the uh, nuclear deal, India should be allowed to enter the NS, uh, NSG. But they also at that time mentioned Australia group and uh, some other conventional weapons group, which we did not join. We did not want to join those chemical weapons, etc. But they uh, you know, proposed it as a package that will be, will be allowed into a missile control program, will be allowed into conventional weapons program, will be allowed into chemical weapons. Now, these are all programs to restrict activities in this to certain people. So, but they were willing to take us all into that. And the package which was presented to us by the Americans also included NSG. But and the Americans keep telling us that they're trying very hard to con convey to the Chinese that should be allowed. But the Chinese have a problem because if India is allowed, they will have to work for Pakistan also to be allowed. 
So both are known and pity countries. And they would, of course, like to have Pakistan, but they would not like to have India. So Prime Minister personally went to many of the NSC countries, you may remember, in 14, 15, 16. He made it a personal mission to go and approach these countries. And their answer was, as I was also saying, that you have an exemption. You have an exemption from NSG without any limit of time or material. So then why do you want to be in the NSG is a question. The answer is, if you are in the NSG, then you can participate in the policy making of the NSG and thus prevent others like Pakistan from entrenching. So that is, seems to be our concern. But as far as supplies are concerned, we have no problem. Any NSG member can sell any material to us on the basis, basis of that exemption, which was supported also by China on a personal phone call made by the president, by President Bush to the Chinese president. It went up to that level. And then they agreed for this exemption. So they say we went out all of the way, all the way to give India the exemption. So why do they want to be members also? This is the Chinese argument. If you want to be a member, go and sign the NPT. Nuclear deal will not do. Is that position? What can you do about it? No, they have said it very clearly that Taiwan is not an independent country. It is uh, a Chinese province uh, which is rebelling against the center. That's all. That's the only status that they have. But in reality, they have dealings with them. They have trade. Like, for example, the first thing they did was some banning some trade from Taiwan when uh, Nancy Pelosi landed in, uh, in Taiwan. So it's a very peculiar situation. But one thing is certain that the Chinese are very clear that they would want to unite the two. And they are only waiting for an opportunity. And in fact, Nancy Pelosi going there was a kind of testing of waters as to what they would do. Because once they start a war or something, it will be very difficult for anybody to uh, control it. And uh, so the new agreement between Russia and China under which China is not supporting the Ukraine war. There is an un unwritten uh, provision there that if China ever wants to capture Taiwan, Russia will support them. So they have some kind of a notional date of 2027, as some people speculate. That is the target time for China to do something. And they will, of course, try various other things to persuade the people of, even when Nancy Pelosi went, there were some, uh, demonstra some demonstrations by anti-American forces in, uh, in Taiwan. So that means there are some people there also. So with that, if that grows, and if they are able to get a majority of the people to support China, it will be easier for them. But Americans have made it very clear, whatever hell or hot water, as they say, they will not allow that to happen. So after Ukraine, the possibility is even more of China doing something about China. But that will be a world war. It will not be like Ukraine. So everybody will be cautious. But uh, the inevitable may happen one day. We don't know in what form it will happen. Well, this is a debatable point <laughs> uh, because the nuclear deal will end when India tests again. It's not written in so many words there, but it has been clarified. If India tests, that will be the end of the nuclear deal. We understand that, we know it. And we have signed it with a clear understanding that if we need to test, we will test and abandon the nuclear deal. That is the option. And so, uh, it is not possible for us to test without this change. But uh, nuclear technology is such that if you don't test, it becomes unwieldy. It becomes uh, uh, unworkable. That is why we tested in 98. What we tested in 74 had become obsolete. And that's why testing was necessary in 98. But now I don't know how long we can go without testing. But it is very clear that if you test, the old sanctions will come back, 
and the American, of course, many things may have changed in the American relations may be very different at that time. But the uh, technical position as of today is that if we test, then the deal is off. I think so. See, in the case of Hong Kong, they agreed to uh, one country, two systems, isn't it? Because they have been violating it all the time. So an arrangement like that is what um, the, they, they should have without violence. In fact, the, China, the Taiwan president had met the Chinese president. I don't remember which year it was. After Americans had uh, normalized relations with China. And between them, there is, there is a certain understanding because it operates as Taipei, you know. In some specialized agencies, Taipei is a member, which is actually Taiwan. Taipei is the capital. So uh, there are some uh, secret understandings between them. And so maybe the Chinese will agree to a suggestion uh, that uh, Taiwan could continue to be a liberal economy, uh, democratic country, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but accepting the, you know, suzerainty of uh, China may not be sovereignty, but suzerainty, and that is probably a mess of solution. And there have been also talks between them, so it is not the world does not know what's going on. But Chinese position is that it must join China one day or the other. And uh, when we, when uh, even the Americans say we believe in one China policy, so. So what is the existence of Taiwan as an independent country for a long time? And we also, we don't recognize Taiwan, but we have a, my own brother was ambassador to Taiwan. He was never called ambassador, he was called a trade representative. Uh, but we have relations with Taiwan for trade and other businesses. But uh, so, so it's, this is the arrangement with many countries, but UN does not recognize Taiwan. It's not a member of uh, the United Nations because repeatedly, China vetoes the membership. So there are too many complications, but we can only hope that it will not turn into a war. And the uh, more important thing is now to stop the trade war before all of us are consumed in that in different forms. So that is the priority. And also there are rumors saying that she went on her own and uh, President Biden had not authorized her, etc. I, of course, don't believe it. It is too important a matter for a mere speaker to deal with, <laughs> though she is number three in the hierarchy of her succession. It was a deliberate act, I would say. But the people say that it was, she's doing it on, on her own because she will not be speaker after November election and this was her last chance to make a flash. All these things are being said, who knows? Well, it is practical practicality because at that part of the world they need an ally in the uh, in the global context of rivalry with China, and so uh, they have uh, the Quad on this side, but on the other side, who do they have? So, an independent Taiwan, a democratic Taiwan, will be in the interest of the United States, but they know it is very difficult to accomplish, and so both the both of them are biding their time. There is no conclusion reached as yet. But the portents are, the, the signs are dangerous and difficult. So we have to just wait and see. I don't think we can afford to have a war with China, frankly. A $5 trillion economy, not even $5 trillion, we are not yet, against a $15 trillion <laughs> dollar economy is not a balanced battle. That is why even in 2020, when the Chinese uh, you know, invaded us, shall we say, uh, what did we do? We approached it four ways. One, negotiations. Number two, strengthening our military capability. Uh, number three, uh, sanctions against China. And number four, establishing good friendships. So this is our four-pronged strategy towards China. And that will continue. If there is no choice, we may have to do various things. But 
I do not think it will be an equal fight and uh, nobody would want to fight any unequal fight. So we are not likely to certainly uh, declare war on China under any circumstances. But at the same time, we have the deterrent capability. China has a known first use uh, principle. We also have one. So we don't need to fear Chinese attacks. And uh, if they attack, we can attack back. <laughs> so that's a deterrence. And therefore, uh, peace is the only option we have with China. No, North Korea is not directly against us. We have good relations with North Korea, good with inverted commas. <laughs> Uh, but what they have done is they have given the technology to Pakistan. So that is where we have a problem with North Korea. Uh, because China has used North Korea as a conduit to supply nuclear bomb to Pakistan. And what Pakistan is a ready-made bomb. They did not develop it, which they exploded in 1998. So uh, that is the link. That is what we are afraid of. And you know that President Trump tried, tried to denuclearize uh, DPRK, and uh, he seemed to be successful. And there was a promise of denuclearization. But there you all know the word denuclearization, DPRK wants to use it in the context of the whole Korean Peninsula, which means South Korea must also cease their nuclear activities and nuclear cooperation with the uh, US and by extension Japan. So North Korea Demilitarization means the entire region. And uh, President Trump appeared to favor that. But the second meeting in Vietnam fizzled out the first day itself. And now North Korea is threatening to develop further their technology, and they are doing that. And they said that the next test, if the North Koreans carry it out, they will become level with the permanent fibers, five members in, the, in their capacity. Not China, not US, but uh, they will be more like UK or France. That level of capacity they would have achieved. So that's the danger. They are against it. They are, uh, they are under the nuclear umbrella of uh, United States. And uh, so whatever US, US with, does with DPRK is with the knowledge of Japan, because Japan has the deepest interest in this particular situation, and South Korea and Japan. So both have this concern. And uh, of course, after Mr. Abe became president, prime minister, Japan's policies have also changed. They have aspiration to become a nuclear power if possible. And um, well, they are not entirely at the mercy of the United States. So these are all the indications of the disorder of the world today. And when it is, if at all, in the next few years, there will be a new global order, all these jigsaw puzzles will have to be fitted in. And then only you can have a sensible nuclear order. But there are so many intangibles, so many unknown factors in all this. Yeah, but the situation has also been complicated by uh, the pandemic. Don't forget that. We had enough problems when there is this calamity to place. And the 9-11. And, and then all the sectarian conflicts all around the world. Because we felt that, uh, you know, after the UN was born and things were um, going on and once the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, you know, there was a unipolar world and we were feeling comfortable by becoming friendly to that uh, central power. And that was the kind of uh, world order that we inherited. Then came the collapse of uh, multilateralism, thanks to President Trump primarily. And uh, then came the 9-11, then came the pandemic, then came the Ukraine war. So this is a little more serious than the pre-First World War situation. 
and the countries are all uh, kind of soft balancing each other. Nobody is joining with anybody. And uh, the, all these groups are meeting, but they produce nothing. I had written something in the Hindu sometime past, saying that uh, multilateralism is not that, this is not the time for it. But continue bilateralism and try to win friends and uh, prepare ourselves for a, a new multipolar world. I can sit down and say this, but those who are operating <laughs> will have to do it. And that takes a lot because they cannot refuse to go to these meetings. But what happens to these meetings? You go there and uh, you can't face the others in the same group. Mr. Jayashankar did not ask for a meeting with the Chinese foreign minister or the Pakistani foreign minister. So what is the point of these groups? And also these groups create uh, you know, declarations which other members do not agree with. But still we have to go. We have to show, show our presence. We have to try to improve this from inside. All these are factors. So, but since everyone is on tender hooks, nobody wants to commit itself to another power. I'm a multilateralist all my life. <laughs> 20 years I've been arguing for multilateralism. So I would never rule that out. But the point I was making was that at this point in history, the, since things stabilize and people feel comfortable with each other, certainly we should continue with multilateral. Otherwise, many of my younger colleagues will lose their jobs. <laughs> so I would not wish them that. So that is essentially that is what we want. But I'm only talking about this particular moment when I see uh, you know, declarations after declarations, which are just reproductions of what used to happen before 2000, uh, you know, uh, before 2000, uh, before 2001. And that kind of declarations are coming out, which is not a great purpose. That's all that I meant. Multilateralism is always good because uh, it has certain uh, principles that are accepted by everybody. But this is like the famous expansion of the Security Council. There is no formula which will accept. Everybody will accept. So the UN's future is at the, in danger. So, but still we have to work for it. I'm not saying that we should work for it. That was not my intention. An Al-Qaeda leader is killed, nobody is going to cry for him. Whatever may be the rule or regulation. How many people cried when uh, America killed Saddam Hussein and also killed uh, uh, Bin Laden? It was only in Kerala, some shops were closed when Saddam Hussein was killed. Nowhere else, nobody raised an issue. So these are just a reality. And uh, there is a limit to uh, personal freedom. When it threatens a whole humankind, it's dangerous than a nuclear weapon, a man like him. So nobody will shed any tears on that account. And nobody will complain. And that is why they did it. Because Mr. Biden wants some kind of a, uh, you know, energizing pill. So he got two pills in one day. One is the killing of the Al-Qaeda chief and second was Pelosi landing in Taiwan. So, so people will say, oh, America is still here. Well, it's too soon to say all that. Nothing much will happen in that terms unless there is a war breaking out. These things will not affect uh, economic situation. Nor, of course, uh, if there is a massive sanctions like in the case of Russia. But these are these are still very early stages, just hobnobbing, and uh, we don't know. I think we have gone into the Taiwan question in some detail because it's not a, a feasible thing for China to take it or to American to prevent it. So there's a certain natural law which will go against any major development out of this. But any disruption in trade, any disruption in uh, supply chains, etc., will, of course, affect us. But that now that's already affecting us. And uh, because of Ukraine war, it may become worse. And if there is another disturbance between uh, China and the US, 
also things will become bad. So, but it is too early to say how this will develop. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.